Awesome. Well, hi everyone, and thanks for joining today's virtual event. Mod Pizza recognizes major industry shifts and adapts quickly. My name is Megan Bolter. I am the Director of Market Development here at Ascensource, and I'm excited to be hosting today's session of the Real Customers of SAP. So the Real Customers of SAP is a no PowerPoint virtual event series where we have the opportunity to hear from and directly speak with real SAP customers in an open and engaging forum. So these sessions will allow customers and industry leaders to share their business pains and their challenges and, and, and the challenges that they solve by leveraging a vast portfolio of technology tools and applications. So for today's discussion, our event speakers will answer questions and openly share their best practices around their S4 HANA migration and also success factors implementations, considering considerations when evaluating these technolo technologies and partners and lessons they learned along the way. Before we kick off today's discussion, I do want to remind you that we are recording the event and it will be available on demand. And then also this is an interactive forum. So you can see that we, we're making people panelists so that they can speak and have their camera on. So we encourage you to hop on camera um, and ask questions that you may have along the way. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can just jump right into the conversation or use the raise hand feature um, or the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll answer in real time. So whichever you prefer, uh, but you know, please remember that this is a conversation, conversational virtual event. So our discussion will be much more valuable with questions and interactions from the audience. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers as well as our moderator. So our first guest speaker is Tara Gamble, uh, residing in Bellevue, Washington. Long-term technologist Tara has a robust career with Mod Pizza, Outer Wall, which owned Redbox, and also Coinstar, another Outer Wall company at that time. Uh, Tara noted that her career has taken her through the business architect path, and she noticed she noted that this base of no knowledge really keeps her passion about technology and innovation alive there at Mod Pizza as the Senior Director of Enterprise Systems. So thank you for joining us today, Tara. Awesome. And then we also have Brenda Reyes uh, residing in Winter Park, Colorado. Brenda focuses on key customers and delivery. So with over 10 years experience in HR process design and technology implementations, she serves as an accountant delivery executive for global clients and has full responsibility for technology projects up to six million in budgets. So thank, thank you, Brenda, for joining the conversation today. Absolutely, thanks for the invite, Megan. Awesome. And then our moderator for the event will be Lauren, Lauren Reinhardt. She is co-founder and COO of Ascensource. Lauren is dedicated to driving strategic growth for Ascensource partners SAP customers and prospects and SAP. And like I mentioned, Lauren will be today's session moderator and facilitator of the discussion with our event speakers and attendees. So I'll kick it over to you, Lauren. Awesome, thanks so much, Megan. Thanks again, Tara and Brenda for joining us today. Um, as we get started, you know, Tara, we got the chance to meet with you prior to today's session, and, and you mentioned that you're a technology enthusiast, and especially being that you're in the casual quick food industry with Mod Pizza, um, and it's a very high growth company growing rapidly. I'd love to set the stage for the discussion and really just kind of start with some industry trends. What are you seeing um, in your corner of the world, and, and how is Mod Pizza um, you know, taking that into consideration for their business model and, and technology investments. Sure, sure. I mean, we could probably start with having everybody take a moment and think about the last time they got food out of outside of their own kitchen. You know, when you did your own order online, maybe you had it delivered, maybe you did pick up, you know, these are all of the important things to our customers. And those are the things that drive so many other things to enable that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you were already seeing the food industry, fast casual, fast food, et cetera, you know, you know, already start a lot of that, that digital transformation, if you will, which started with that digital online ordering. And then, you know, the pandemic came and like with many other things, just, you know, put a spotlight on it and really magnified the need 
And so you find that, you know, again, in food, but in particular, fast casual, my industry, it was about managing that customer experience and providing that digital online experience and the delivery that then became really important for pandemic handling and all those other things, curbside pickup and contactless payments and, you know, all the things that are continuing and will likely remain one way streets, you know, and so coupled with that also in our industry, it's not like an equal importance, it's a different kind of importance and that's our employees. You know, you've got, you know, customer facing folks that are all about the mod experience and preparing amazing food while we're doing it. And so, you know, likewise, the pandemic put a really big uh, importance on wellness and, and managing that employee experience. And, you know, like we all had to continue to learn, what does this mean? What do we have to do to manage it? What are those impacts? And we're continuing to learn and, you know, flex as things change. And so, you know, you've got those two kind of meta topics, your customer and your employee experience. And where they kind of meet in the middle is how you get your food to them, you know, that digital ordering and, and delivery and, and those types of types of things. So that's kind of, I, I think, more at that, that meta level. Yeah. And before I, I switch to you, Brenda, you know, for those who may not be as familiar with Mod Pizza, um, you know, I feel like they're, I kind of joked before we joined that they're SAP famous, you know, you're one of the, the big reference customers. Um, but you guys are a casual pizza restaurant. You're based in Washington, um, established in 2008, so a relatively new company um, owned by a husband and wife duo. And you guys did have that fast track expansion, like you mentioned, in, in a very short amount of time. And so technology becomes an integral part to, to be able to keep up with that. Um, you mentioned your employees in, in four years, um, you doubled your employee count to over 9,000 today. I'm sure it's even, even growing daily. Um, and so obviously to, to handle that growth, you know, you looked at technologies like S4 HANA, obviously success factors, the reason, you know, we're here today and, and most recently Qualtrics, I think we'll touch on as well for that employee experience management. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone's kind of familiar with, with your story. Um, and certainly, you know, Tara, if you don't mind sharing with the audience, um, you know, what you guys did implement from a success factor module perspective, um, as well as kind of that timeline and, and how, how you approached it at a high level before we kind of dive into the, the nitty gritty of the project. You bet, you bet. Well, and, you know, to riff off of that customer experience and the employee experience, you know, what you have to focus on chief and, and, and foremost is, is your, your transactions. You know, you have to have your operational processes, you know, locked down. And as you mentioned, MOD was born in 2008. And it really started to grow in 2015. And so you think from 2015 to now, that's really not even a lot of time, but you had a real hockey stick of growth. And so you've got all those traditional uh, challenges, you know, you want, you need to be able to scale, you need to keep your, your data secure. You know, you need to have uh, speed in implementation, speed in training, speed in the ability to kind of get it to market, if you will, so people can use it and use it well. And, you know, the ability to manage it through time, you know, all those key concerns. And so that's what Maud was looking for first. You know, we've got to manage scale. So we went looking for an ERP system. And, you know, when you're looking for an ERP system, as I mentioned, it's, it's heavy in operations, but it's also kind of where everything around the entire company lands. And so it starts a lot of other conversations around what are all those profit and loss centers, you know, all the P&Ls that make up your ERP. And so thus begun kind of that, uh, well, while we were evaluating, you know, ERP systems, that's when SAP was part of that list. And then, you know, I've also, many of us had worked with success factors in prior lives. And so that became part of that uh, kind of power of the platform, if you will. And so as we were evaluating all of those operational needs that we needed for the customer experience through the transaction journey, it just underscored that we were growing up really fast. As you mentioned, we over doubled the employee count. We needed to put that, that focus and attention in all of those employee uh, management processes. And that was part of that evaluation process. You had this emerging public cloud product. And yes, we are the first to go live in North America with S4 Public Cloud. 
And then September of 2017 is when we went live. So we are approaching, you know, a, a good four productive years there. And we implemented success. Actually, we went through that selection process and, and the two platforms together, you know, there's a, a narrative all, you know, behind that as, as why we selected those, pro those, those products, but we implemented them in tandem. And so that was a really um, a, kind of an amazing journey to take a, a fast casual restaurant shop with very, very lean, small teams and implement an enterprise class ERP and human capital management system at the same time. And we were able to do that first and fundamentally through two things. One, these are SaaS products. These are both you know, in the cloud, software as a service. And we also had to rely on our service system implementation parties. So you have to have a lot of help you know, to do this. So we did, and it was at the time, SAP also had a, uh, I would say at least a rebranded, but a, a newer implementation um, cycle called the Activate Methodology. And so we were one of, you know, the early companies to really, you know, get our arms around the Activate Methodology and, you know, take advantage of some process of process. And so, you know, interesting enough, I don't know if this is going to come up on topic, but the implementation for your ERP versus your success factors, you know, is just so incredibly different with the way you gather the requirements and walk it forward. That's kind of, I think, a session in and of itself, maybe someday. But kind of getting back to the story of success factors. And so once we started that journey, I would share that we knew we needed Employee Central. That was, you know, the power of the HRIS. We were really trying to solve some pain with applicant tracking. And I think that's what a lot of businesses do. You go to fix your pain. And we were having some pretty good problems. We'd really overextended our ATS system, you know, a little baby cloud system. And so we knew we needed HRIS. We knew we needed to up our game for recruiting. Remember, we're growing, we're hiring like gangbusters. And so you gotta get better there. And so that's what we initially saw with success factors was EC and the recruiting, and it was actually recruiting management and recruiting marketing at the time. Now it's just this wonderful big recruiting package. And we didn't think we were going to implement onboarding at the same time. We thought we could <laughs> get away with using the onboarding that we were using in our payroll system, which was kind of our quasi HRIS. That's the one we were also really pushing its limits. And as we started our implementation journey, we'd signed papers with SAP. We were in it to win it. And as you're really walking your end-to-end -end processes and you're saying, all right, we're going to recruit here in success factors. Now we're going to jump over here and do some onboarding. And now I got to get my data back to Employee Central to finish business. You know, that's when you have to step back and do some cost benefit analysis, which we did. And we decided to bring in onboarding as well. And so we then were able to manage recruiting, onboarding and EC in that initial implementation. And so with a very small team of some business folks in our people team and maybe two people on the technical team because we were very small and very much in our early phases of growing. Uh, we were able to implement these three modules in roughly nine months. And so uh, it was, and you know, again, while we are in tandem implementing the S4 HANA Cloud Public. And so it was, uh, it was quite an experience as all implementations are. And I would say that it was just earlier, maybe mid 2020, we implemented learning management and we were really excited. We'd been building that for a while. Uh, COVID, the pandemic did slow us down. We had to slow some things down because we went through some furloughs and we had to really hyper-focus on our that, that store wellness and customer execution. So we had to, you know, slow that down, but we were really fortunate to get right back up on that. And now we are uh, completely rolled out with learning management and the learning management, I would also add is, is a really interesting pivot for MOD. It's one of the first corporate systems that we have extended to our franchise partners. 
Maud is 25% roughly franchised. And, you know, aside from those main systems like your point of sale and your online ordering and your loyalty programs, they're franchisees. They have access to their own tool sets, you know, but when you think about a brand and consistency and the training experience, the learning experience, you know, you want to leverage these world-class tools that we had just invested and implemented. And so we are now rolling our learning out to our franchisees. And that's just opening a big door for MOD. So I probably went all over the map there, um, Lauren, but, you know, again, you know, a lot of capabilities all being thought about, planned and implemented and then continuing, you know, naturally to, to add on, whether it's big module or just managing the release cycles, you know, with that constant mm -hmm. uh, roadway, you know, that runway of, of innovation. Yeah. 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 I think it's really interesting. So you did three modules of success factors while also doing your ERP implementation in just nine months. I think that really speaks to, you know, as you said, the SaaS model and being cloud um, with only two, you know, IT folks really from your side, um, which speaks to having great partners. Um, so, you know, Brenda, I'd love to kind of get your perspective on, on Mod Pizza's approach and, you know, were you guys in favor of, hey, let's do two big, you know, projects at the same time? Um, curious kind of how that went from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, I wasn't connected with um, myself. I wasn't connected with Tara um, back in 2015. Our relationship is a little bit newer. Um, so I didn't go through the full implementation cycle with them, but, um, but generally in that partnership, when Rising uh, came on board and our legacy company came on board to, to uh, work with Tara and the team, we were a part of um, a larger group um, that was working with them, right? They had vendors, um, a, a vendor for S4, a vendor for success factors, and everybody worked um, in collaboration. So that kind of model, we see it often uh, with our customers because, um, more and more, I think everyone, um, many of you as well that might be on the phone with us, right? You, you may also be at a place where you're starting to evaluate when is the right time to make a move and do I uh, look at multiple systems at the same time or you know, are we just gonna focus on, on one piece um, and um, bite the, uh, what are they, eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? Um, so I, I think you know, based on, on your business case, um, there's always some key decisions around internal resources, overall budget, uh, your roadmap, uh, where you need to be in five years. And so, you know, as we uh, would have done with Mod Pizza at the time and what we do, what I do all the time now with our um, newer customers that are still starting that journey is to begin evaluating that business case. Uh, you know, what is the right approach for you? What are the factors and key considerations that would go into that decision? And, um, and so, you know, we would have at the time worked with, with Mod Pizza and Tara and the team, uh, just like we do now saying, uh, you know, taking that next step to help our customers along that journey uh, to make those decisions as they move in and, and begin planning for a project. If I can yeah, riff on that. Can, can I riff yeah, on that ahead, for Tara. a second? You know, and, and you think about, I mean, there's pros and cons on that whole double up and, you know, go all in kind of an activity. But the one, the one thing that I would like to float out there, especially for people that are evaluating success factors, and you look at potential opportunity with the other SAP products, the way the architecture is moving forward and, and advancing, you kind of have to. You have to understand where some of that leg bone is connected to the knee bone and in, in some really important aspects, whether it's identity, which leads to security, which is a big deal for all of us on, you know, in, in the back office that have to support those things, you know, and some of that master data integration. There are some really great things coming and already happening that you need to know about you know, from the, the, the business transformation platform itself. And so having partners like Rising that are out there doing that with you and for you is becoming so critical because it's just almost impossible. It's hard to keep up on your own with all right. of those advancements. Right. Thank you for letting yeah. me. And, that. Yeah, and I think Paige has a question for you guys. Yes, I do. Oop. 
Paige, we lost your audio. <laughs> we'll come back to Paige. <laughs> Reese, I saw you put one in the chat. Do you want to ask your question while we wait for Paige? Sure. Um, so the, the question I had was about, because uh, obviously, Terry, you just had, oh, hold on. Get out of here. My cat's going to jump up there a lot. Um, but for all of these big projects, the question I had is more so about when you knew you had to start those. Because, of course, as your company continues to grow, there's always that thought in the back of your mind that this is something we're going to have to get to eventually. But what was that tipping point where you knew, OK, we need to start this now. Otherwise, it'll be detrimental to us to wait any longer. You know, it's a good one. It, it is because timing and every company has got its own kind of special sauce there. My answer is kind of bottom up and top down. I think it's all about drivers. There's things that drive change. And let's start with the bottom up. The bottom up is just your company's running a certain way that it's running. And so the people that are managing those processes, you kind of know where things are good and you kind of know where things aren't. And as you get better at uh, quantifying where it can be better, you know, you kind of get that experiential information. Maybe things are just broken you know, and there's just obvious things that you know that can be improved. So I think sometimes you just get like a welling factor, you know, it just gets so painful for people to get their jobs done. And that shows up in KPIs, it shows up in survey results about how happy people are, you know, so you got to have people looking for that information. And that's, you know, like kind of the operational like right there. And then that top down you know, you, you're looking to your leaders to do those, you know, that, that kind of needful planning. And, you know, if depending upon what those kind of, I'm speaking really vague, but like what those big milestones are coming that, you know, in order to support that. And if we want to support that to this level of expectation, then we're going to need a thing. And I think that's where technologists are getting and should be getting more loud and proud about quantifying business, these capabilities, you might not even need, you don't know you need them, but we do, and this is why, and you know, start to surface those things. And the bigger the rock, the longer you have to do that, right? It's kind of the, say it seven different ways, seven different times, or maybe backwards there, but you know, I mean, it's, it's a hard one because organizations are so different, but I find it's about drivers, you know, otherwise change doesn't happen. Most, a lot of organizations really wait for the pain to be so painful. And then, you know, you kind of have to at that point. Yeah. Right. It, it, I don't say, cause it makes me think of like having a house, you know, if you know, eventually you're going to want to get the floors redone, you know, eventually you're going to want to paint the cabinets, Like, do you wait for a floorboard to actually break before you do that? Or, and I, I guess, like you said, it sort of does depend on the homeowner's mindset. And in this case, and prioritization, good. you know, prioritization, because, you know, if you can, if you can get a sense of how stable that squeaky board is, and if you can manage, if you can manage the squeak, without going insane and, and maybe there's, you know, some, maybe you got to get a new septic system because you got other critical services in your house that just got, I mean, it's just, it's the constant prioritization, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. And during this, uh, this past year, I think Tara, your, you and your team went into development mode, maybe in some other areas, right? Around operational services and um, adjusting to the COVID environment. Um, you know, we have other clients in, in retail or um, quick serve restaurant uh, space, you know, very customer service focused where, you know, they didn't just shut down over the past year. Um, but what many of them realized is they weren't in as good of a place as Mod Pizza, right? They needed to be able to bring in um, a people management tool because they were so lacking in that area. So in that case, Reese, you know, in my example, these other customers, they did wait until the floorboards started kind of breaking and they were hopping across the floor trying to get past it. And they realized this is not um, uh, sustainable, right? We can't move into a period of growth um, with more and more individuals, you know, do, taking uh, takeout without being able to hire quickly, without being able to fill some of these positions. Yeah, and I feel like if you wait until that that critical moment where you, you can't, you know, to continue with our analogy, the floor is falling in, I feel like you're not in a position to make the best decisions because now you're being very reactive 
you're trying to fix problems while also, you know, maintaining some sort of status quo. And so by being, you know, a little more proactive, you're able to make good business decisions and, and do what's best for, for the today, as well as the future of the company. So I think that's a good, a good analogy. And, and you yeah. know, Paige, do we have you now? <laughs> I don't know. Hi, guys. Am I here? I'm having technology <laughs> issues. Sorry about that. Hi, Tara. Hi, Brenda. It's nice to see you ladies again. Um, so my question, um, if you guys can hear me, I think you can. Um, my question is just, first of all, Tara, I think what you guys have done is incredibly impressive. I mean, you and your team should be so proud of what you've been able to accomplish. You know, we hear all the time from customers that ERP is a really big, scary word. Sometimes technology and change and innovation are also scary. And the fact that you guys were able to take on, you know, kind of two projects at once is just, Wow. So uh, kudos to you and the team. But uh, my question was more around, you know, you talked about this rapid growth and having this lean team. And I think sometimes when people think of uh, implementing technology, that's going to take up a ton of resources and you're just trying to kind of survive and grow and, and get through the day to day. So how did you guys kind of combat that issue of, of resources, having this lean team, but being able to tackle the projects that you knew you needed to to be able to continue to grow successfully? You know, that is one that I'm gonna give you an answer of the early days because it continues to change. You know, MOD continues to yeah. mature and the software continues to mature. And so you've got these, these, you know, interwoven paths. And I will tell you straight out, when we were implementing in the early days, we were completely strapped, but we had those, those drivers we were just talking to Reese about, those pain points. They were so painful and they were so necessary. We just, you know, kind of had to bootstrap it and, and do it. And, you know, I think it's, it's just some of those critical path items that you just need to work through. But what it was doing, it was also exposing that you really need to get a grip on what processes you're creating. And you really need to understand the expectations around them because some processes, it's probably okay if they are executing at 95%, but some, if they are not five nines or what have you, then your business is going to suffer. And so you need to know what does it take to maintain those and you're constantly learning. And, and you're also constantly working on your own like organizational design. You know, what kind of resources do you need to care and feed for these things properly. And that's always a journey with no end as well. You never quite get, at least me, you know what you want, you know, I mean, restaurants run really, really tight for technology, but it does come back to your scope as well. You know, I do want to be clear about, you know, while we were being really, really in depth in our success factors implementation, our use of our ERP is not, you know, really, really large and deep. We use it for all of our core accounting and project services and fixed asset management. And, you know, we're just starting to get into procurement. And so if you're in a shop where you're doing, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot more capabilities, it, it's, it's a different conversation. You know, now you have more resources by just sheer nature of, of who knows what, where are your subject matter experts and who's designing future state. I think that's something I reflect on more than anything is that people really are good at getting into build mode. They really are. You might have some of that upfront, oh my gosh, here we go. This is going to be, oh, you know, and then once you get in there and then they want to build, they want to solve problems. But if you're not having some people zooming out and kind of directionally keeping things on on target, because you don't always have the answers. I mean, look at how many things pandemic has changed or highlighted. And I mean, the word pivot, I haven't ever heard it as much as lately, you know. And so what you know you have to do is get your core stuff really, really stabilized. And then you can be better at managing all of that, you know, those agile needs and, uh, you know, kind of filling those gaps. So the resourcing question is always a challenge. It is. And P&Ls are different with the tolerances, you know, for, for different shops as well, you know. So I think that's it's a super great answer for you because I think that's how challenging it is. <laughs> No, I think that that yeah. makes a lot of sense. And just being able to identify, you know, exactly to, to Reese's earlier question, you know, 
how painful is it? But also getting the buy-in and it sounds like they were excited to solve problems. And so having that I'm sure helped quite a bit as well, but no, that was a, that was a great answer. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Paige. Um, so before we kind of jump into the, the project a little bit, I do want to spend just a moment kind of talking about that evaluation process. You know, obviously you guys were a growing company very rapidly. It sounded like you were using systems that, you know, made sense when you were a much smaller. Um, so what did that evaluation process look like and, and why did you ultimately select, um, you know, SAP success factors? Well, again, kind of going back to what our chief pain point was, ERP, and some of those some of those key terms that just resonate, not just for not just for S four, but for success factors as well, is best practice, best practice processes. You know, this is you, as a business, you got to figure out what you need to differentiate and what you need to innovate at. And where you don't, you need to lean on the best that you can afford, you know, you need to go to the knowledge and the experience. And so SAP has all of that, but as we were evaluating the cloud, we had to have a public, you know, SaaS nature, we had to be able to uh, have light administration, you know, again, just where that, where the, where the needs and the resource requirements are. And it had to scale, scaled, you know, we knew we were on a growth plan, MOD continues to want to grow. And so you have to know you can manage scale security. You know, you're talking about your, your ERP. So there has to be that trusted uh, vendor and the way they secure all your good stuff and certainly in your people data area as well. And, you know, just that the reliability and usability and, you know, that I mentioned before that speed, you know, it can't just be some of these monolithic, overwhelming legacy type things, you know, it's got to be more of the current architecture, more of the current UI, all those kinds of things. And so all these boxes are being checked. And then you get the interoperability, you know, between your ERP and your people systems and, you know, other systems like Qualtrics and should companies use other SAP products, it just continues to, to raise the opportunity, you know, of, of all of the end-to-end -end processes. So, um, yeah. No, that's great. And so once, you know, you selected the, the, the solutions, you got your ERP, you got your success factors, um, what did the process look like internally from like a committee perspective? How did you guys organize that? Um, uh, on our last session with Brenda, you know, we talked a fair amount about really, you know, how much work went into before they even started the project, all the planning that goes into that um, and the communication that's required. Um, so I'm curious kind of how you guys manage that and maybe something that you're like proud that you guys did really well and maybe something, eh, if I had to do this over again, I think we could have made a better decision here or I would give, you know, that advice to someone listening today. Well, as and I think Brenda touched on this earlier, because we were implementing ERP and success factors at the same time, we did have to lean on two different system implementation teams. Just there's very few that will do both for good reasons. And so you've got a lot of project managers, you know, you've got your PM for your ERP, you've got your PM for your success factors, and then you have your mod, your mod team. And it was, that was again, a small team that was mostly, I can't even remember the exact, so actually it's, it's kind of a blur. But what we did is, you know, you're kind of running two projects through the activate methodologies, especially on the S4 side. And, you know, success factors has its own specific methodology as well, where you're using your configuration workbooks and you're going through your as is to be, you know, process methodologies. And it kind of depends on your, your partner as well. I've seen a few varieties of flavors of, of implementation models, but generally it's the software development life cycle, you know? And so what we had to really focus on though was keeping them connected and having that overarching design. And just Mod's special story is, you know, we were so early on with S4, it was still a really nascent product. So SAP was figuring a couple of things out as we were cooking it. And so that got a little interesting at times, especially in some of the few things that we were integrating between the systems. So it was uh, you know, trying to keep, 
key milestones, you know, what is that sequence of events that you really needed to gate things, you know, and understand a lot of your traditional project management requirements, where are your key dependencies, key milestones, where do you, and then that back to that resource question, you know, um, depending upon the size of your shop, you're often using the people running the business to improve the business and they can't stop running it. And so that knowledge of the rhythm of your business has got to be first and foremost so that you don't disrupt it. And then how you, you know, weave in and around and, you know, get a little bit of soup from the stone when you need it and, and you know, get things moving as you need it. I think that that's just, you know, a lot of the traditional project management challenges. Um, I did mention, I do think it was a completely, um, I'm so glad our leadership and everything, all the moons aligned that we were able to bring onboarding in as well. I think that, you know, budget is always a concern. There's lots of things that I want, but it's back to that priority list. You know, there's a lot of lists in the businesses and technology is just a part of it, you know? And so, you know, when I think about when we looked at that cost benefit of doing it differently versus doing it this way, you need people who can do that. You need people who can put those narratives in front of decision makers. And the this might be a, a tiny bit of a tangent, but you know, even when you're making choices within the platform, you have to make choices. There's so many different ways you can go, so many different things you can do. Even once you license it, you still have to understand what you need to do in what order. And then make your choices. It's a roadmap. You know, we knew and be ready to make, be ready to make some decisions, some hard decisions on what your MVP is, your minimum viable product. You know, what do we need to go to market with? What can we run our business with? And then begins your roadmap. It's a roadmap with no end. You're always seeking to improve it. And oftentimes your first phase of improvement is just finishing what you didn't get finished in your initial implementation. That's just how, you know, that's just how it goes. It's because you're making decisions. You want the good stuff, good, you want it badly enough that, you know, you get there and get that lift, get people bought in, change management. You know, that you talk about the envelope around everything, you know, coming back to mod. One of the things that we continued and I do in every implementation, you know, because we've implemented a lot of software, it's how do leaders really not just walk the talk, but embody that this is not happening to people. This is not happening to our employees. This is happening because of them, you know, and this is where you get that voice. This is where you want to find ways to you know, bring the diversity of point of view, you know, and, you know, when I think back to that bottom up that when we were talking with Reese about the people that are running the processes and closest to the processes have gold mines of information. And we've got to develop the avenues to get that. That takes us into listening, you know, that's like that whole other, you know, capability that's become so really important in the employee experience management, you know, so that's all kind of connected too. Did you have any challenges around change management and adoption? You know, when I look at a model like yours, you've got franchises, you've got restaurants, you know, all across the country, and then you have headquarters. And I imagine there could be challenges kind of pushing that adoption down and getting that feedback back. Was that a, a challenge for you guys? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we did you know, even with our tiny teams, they did a fantastic job with, you know, training materials and training sessions. But, you know, this wasn't just up-leveling our system. It was really kind of digitizing. It was the true digital transformation. When we implemented success factors, we truly went from a PDF, if you were lucky, but a paper copy of a job rec. And now, now every general manager had to log in if they wanted to hire people. And that just freaks people out in early days. Yeah. You know, it's just a freak out factor. I don't care what anybody says, change management should be, you know, topic one, just manage the freak outs because they're going to happen, especially when you're in an environment like a mod store. I don't know how many of you have been into a busy mod 
but it can get really busy. Obviously they're not hiring at that point in time, you know, but they're busy a lot. And so yeah, that was a huge hurdle. That's a huge hurdle. And that was probably one of the first, when I think back, those were some of our first really digitized processes that we were leaning on our general managers to get good at is your people processes, hiring right. and managing change you know, and, and, uh, and all that good stuff. And, and then that kind of marked the beginning of bringing more and more digitized processes to our stores as well. So this is kind of, this was the, the first bit of tough love almost, you know. And I really yeah. love how you put it. Oh, sorry, Lauren. I was just going to say, Tara, I really love how you said it. it's not happening to you, it's happening for you. And mm -hmm. I kind of think that also just embodies success factors, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this technology is being implemented for that employee experience to start with your people processes. So I feel like that, you know, while change management is probably the hardest part, I really appreciate that perspective too. And I, and I always tell my team, you know, at least sharing the why, you know, why is this happening? We're, this isn't happening because we just want to throw more on your plates. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We want to make better processes for you and solve pains that you're feeling today. So I love how you just put that. I think that that's a, a really uh, unique perspective. And when you said that, yeah, I automatically thought of your, you know, your guys' unique franchising model. I think it's like 25% or something are, are franchise owners. And I've, I've read about technology transformation with a franchise model before. And that was always like the, you know, some, some people that struggle the most with it. Like, why is this happening to me, if you will? But to your point, you know, you're trying to elevate the experience for their employees and in the long term, make them more money by being more efficient and stuff like that. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely, I, I'd love to hear, I loved to hear how you, how you guys rolled that out. And, um, and I think that may go hand in hand with also the, you know, recent Qualtrics rollout that you guys are working on to just kind of monitor how people feel about different things. Um, I, I don't think that we've gotten that. I don't want to jump ahead though, either, but, um, I would love to hear about your, your recent Qualtrics rollout as well. Yeah, I mean, I can jump into yeah, that. Yeah, Megan, I think that's a good segue. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. We're, well, we're, 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 we are new at it. We have, we have implemented one pulse survey and we are teeing up a census survey, kind of those once a year big bangs. And then we also have in kind of on the back burner a lot going on, we are getting ready to um, start our first life cycle surveys and we're going to target exits. You know, y'all think about what we're seeing in and around us. And I know Maud's experiencing the hiring crisis. And, you know, naturally that has those, there's those drivers that we were talking about, right? Whether they're bottom up, top down, coming at you sideways from the market. So here we have this, this pressure coming in with, it's hard to hire people right now. We have had to close stores due to some hiring challenges from time to time. So here we've just gone through finally getting them all back open from COVID, et cetera. And then now this is kind of a different wave of, of challenge. And so, you know, when, when you think about, you know, where you're pivoting, you've got to be able to understand what's going on and what that experience is. So we, we, got Caltrix up and running. We've already got some great pulse information that we're actively, you know, eva not evaluating, but managing now. And the census survey will be a really great set of benchmark data, especially when we measure that against last year's mid pandemic. And then one year prior, it's gonna be a really interesting kind of three years in a row, given, you know, what's what's been going on, you know, and, and so, We've been largely focused on understanding the platform and, you know, remember Qualtrics is, is got four pillars in there and we're just starting to crack away at the first one for employee. And so, you know, we're going to try to get expert on that. And then we certainly have grand plans to, you know, go forward and do more in customer and, and brand and product. But, you know, it's, it's even already fascinating to see how, how much more quickly uh, you can get the information and then naturally, I don't want to sell the product, but the way you can look at the stuff is really, really um, empowering as well. So 
stay tuned on that one. We're, we're definitely are at the early bit of that journey, but, you know, especially at an organ, any organization, but it's underscored at mod, you know, we are a people organization. We use pizza as the platform, you know, it is about taking care of our employees and communities, et cetera. And it's about opportunity. And, you know, if you don't have that reflexive loop with your, with your employees, you're just going to miss out and we're going to lose them. And so, you know, you got to get all types of that feedback, you know, Qualtrics is going to already helping us unlock that. Next phase on that is where we start to figure out how to mash that up. You know, there's even other grand things that we've got eyes on roadmap, you know, for maybe analytics cloud, you know, where you've got some people data and some ERP data and some Qualtrics data. I mean, the, the narratives you're having to figure out today so that you can make those quick decisions, data, 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 you know, data-driven decisions. And so these three tools are really heavy in our arsenal to get us that. I had a quick I'm so happy around. to hear that it's going out or it's going well. Yeah. Go, Andy. Sorry. I had a quick question around Qualtrics data. I mean, as you guys get all the information, I know last year was very much an anomaly of an year. Uh, I'm sure that skews a lot of data. Um, and I'm wondering, within using that data and kind of implementing it, like, is that something that you factor in as seeing this anomaly and kind of seeing things go more in terms of uh, norm as, as things progress? Like, how, how are you guys factoring all that into as in, in terms of all the decision making process moving forward? The thing, thing number one is that we're, we are figuring out how to do that because you hit on kind of the, the meat of the topic and that is these anomalies. And when you think about the power of platforms like Qualtrics, they come with all this benchmark data. And how do you arrive at benchmark data through time? Now you got this blip of time that's so weird. We're even working with our, it's, I think it's Workforce Services Associate, you know, the, 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 the specialists that we partnered with to understand how to properly factor those things in. It's not too unlike how we're having to do some of that for our revenue. When you look at the customer behavior, you know, you look at our comps year over year and you have to, you know, as we look at the pizza that we sold last March, last March when 2020, you know, our pizza went way down. So it's, it's, I think we're all trying to solve for what this anomaly does in our data sets. I think that's a really great Great question. Don't think we have fully solved it, but I think you can also kind of, there's some core things in there too, you know, that employee experience. I defer to the specialists on that. I mean, the psychologists get involved in this. It's some really amazing stuff that we're doing, but you know, how do you tease out what those core experience things are almost regardless of, you know, what's going on, but again, trying to get it all trying to get it all, you know, distilled so that you can inform better decisions. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do with it, you know, especially what you need to invest more into tools like success factors, you know, that's where you get some of your, your input data. That kind of give you a sense of, I don't really have a hard answer on it because, you know, we're still, we're still in it. We're still kind yeah. of in an odd spot. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. I mean, I mean, it was a tough question. I apologize, yeah. but uh, yeah, no, I it's, figured. But it's top of mind, though. You're right. it's what we're all solving for, Andy. It's true. Right. Well, I mean, I, I was curious, and you answered it pretty well. When you when you're looking at the data, I was kind of wondering how much of you know human critical thinking kind of applies to a lot of it, or how much data Qualtrics is able to kind of provide on its own. You know, yeah. moving forward, yeah. transition decision making so yeah and, and what this year will do to further surveys as a piece of data you know in the history of things you know right. they'll continue given yeah yeah great question so my next um question and we're, we're coming up on time here so if anyone has any questions you know certainly put them in the chat or, or raise your hand um but you know obviously for a successful implementation it it takes both the you know the mod pizza and and rising to make it successful. So Brenda, I'm kind of curious from your perspective when when you look at a company like Mod Pizza, you know, fast growing, um, you know, kind of where their revenue size is, what their goals are going to be from an employee headcount. You know, we talked about doubling in four years. You know, what advice do you give them, and and how do you kind of manage that that project for for like like organizations? Yeah, I think. It's, it's great to have amazing customers like Tara and her team, right? Um, 
from the earliest phases um, of the implementation and our relationship with them, they've been one who, um, you know, they just really buckle down, right? Her team, the folks that work for her in HRIS, they really know the system. They're excellent system administrators on their own. Uh, they definitely come to us for strategic support, configuration um, support. We have an ongoing um, maintenance agreement with them. And we meet monthly to talk about strategy, right? What's on the roadmap? What's coming up? So I think one of the things that I would encourage folks that are not yet there, um, but thinking about their uh, transformation to the cloud or about you know implementing technologies like success factors or Qualtrics, um, you know, of course, I'd say first of all, you know, do find a, a good partner and establish that long-term relationship uh, where you can get the kind of support that uh, we've been able to give Mon. Um, you know, but more than that, I think it's really begin to evaluate your internal readiness, uh, begin to look at how ready are you for that project? What would need to fall into place? Are, do you have the type of executive support you would need to get the funding, to get the budget approval, to even begin considering a solution? Um, if that's not in place, then stop right there and, and that's your homework, you know, for the next few months. Um, you know, if you are there and, and you think the, the project is moving, could move forward and you've got that support, then, then what's the next step? Uh, do you have your operating model in place for the project itself and then to sustain the project afterwards? Um, you know, if not, that again is your next step to begin building and growing. And so, it, you know, some of it is responding to those drivers, uh, you know, starting to see what the main pain points are uh, for yourself as an organization. Uh, but if it is, um, if there is a SaaS product or a cloud implementation in your future, um, you know, because of, of how you've prioritized your HR uh, roadmap, uh, you know, then certainly that's some of my advice uh, for your next steps. No, that's great. And then Tara, you know, kind of same question to you when evaluating partners, you know, what are the things that, that you look for in, in a good partner um, to, to have the relationship that you clearly have with Rising today? You know, there's kind of three things. The ability to solve problems, right? You have to run. You have to be able to run your business. And a partner that can kind of onboard and get a grip on what you've built, regardless of why, a little bit of why is important, you know, but they've got to be able to understand the core, you know, and that's those best practice processes and that through skills and experience, you know, you have to be able to have that level of confidence there, you know, to, to solve problems. And I also want somebody like rising, they bring ideas. There's got to be that, that looking forward with what's happening in the industries, what's happening in software, what's happening in technology, you know, and be a thought leader and help us look around corners, you know, because we really are busy running. And there has to be execution. I think that is kind of, that's a hard one to interview anybody on because that just takes time and uh, time. And, but you can, you know, kind of get to some of those KPIs. Obviously, you know, it depends on the organization to, you know, what Brenda was saying and what is your, your operating model? How well are you set up to serve yourself? How much help are you think you're gonna need? You need to know some of those kind of barometer things and, and that informs a lot there, you know, but it, it, and I think patience and grace too, because, you know, companies are figuring things out and, you know, having a partner that understands the rhythm and learns the rhythm, you know, like Brenda will tell you there, we had to, it's not like we checked out. We had to really hyper-focus on some very specific things for a while during early pandemic and so you know partners that understand that and and even try to find creative ways to help that should become part of the language too so those are those are some important things and in the world of SaaS in particular you know there are just some things you can't do your vendor has to do and so they have to be reliable they have to be accurate you know and understand that they are an extension of your shop and so that's, that's how I treat all of our vendors. You know, our success is our success, you know, and our opportunities are our opportunities, you know, and I think that goes a long way. And whether or not that's a vendor that's directly connected to my software, like success factors, or I got to put a plug in for 
organizations like ASUG, you know, and when you've got organizations that are also putting investment and skills and experience and ad advocacy into these really wide and deep platforms, you, you need help. You just need help. It takes a village, you know, and so you got to pick the right horses. No, I think that is great advice. And I know we just have uh, one one moment left. Um, any last questions from the team and, and those attending? Otherwise, you know, Megan, I'm happy to, to send it back to you or any, any final thoughts from, from our guests today. I have a final thought and it's something that <laughs> is, <laughs> it's not really a final thought, it's a pervasive thought. You know, regardless of a composition of a company, whether it's on the, the, the tech side, whether it's maybe in a, a highly capable business side, is you need to find the people who can draw the pictures and really get a sense of current state. I think that's becoming more important by the day is to have some of that enterprise architecture capability. You don't have to have EAs by title. You just have to have some skills and some capabilities to understand what you have where you're headed and really understand how to architect the gap because the choices are getting more complicated. You know, when I arrived at MOD, we didn't have a lot of choice. We had to do a lot of build. Now we've swung the pendulum. I have choices now and I need to make really smart choices for MOD. And so what you need to do in order to make those inform smart choices, you know, you, you've got to get those skill sets uh, uh, you know, developed if they're not already on that path. I think that is, no matter what your industry, what your software stack is, that that's becoming, um, it's always been important, but speed is making it more so. No, I think that's a, a great, great note to end on. So I'll turn it back to you and thank you again, both of you for, for joining us today. Megan? Yep, thank you. I'm going to, can you guys see my screen real quick? Yes. Maybe, yeah. kind of. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to show um, some of the graphic or some of the other events that we have coming up. So obviously today is Mod Pizza. We also have um, iMark Group and their S4 HANA story, uh, Treehouse Food and, and their story around SAP IDP. Uh, we also have a GCP cloud migration strategy, uh, real customer session that we're doing with Cisco which is um, a really big bottling company um, in Costa Rica and in the US as well. And then we have NAPA or um, New York Power Authority is gonna go through their um, transformation for um, SAP Analytics Cloud and forecasting, which is gonna be a really cool session. And then of course we have uh, Mohawk Flooring, uh, one of the largest flooring manufacturers in the world with their um, supply chain event as well. So. Uh, we'll go ahead and send out uh, the recording as well as some of our upcoming events. So Phil, I hope that you, you know, join us for future events as well. And I want to take time today or time right now to thank our panelists today. Um, uh, you know, Tara and Brenda, it was, it was great to hear from you. And I, again, thank you for your time today. And then also thank you to those who are attending and participation in discussion. I hope everyone, you know, stay safe and we hope to see you at our next events. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Sorry about the cat. Don't be. <laughs> He's <laughs> persistent. I put the treats up on my desk one time, and ever since then, for months now, he just always thinks that. Come on, him. Reese. That's one of the best parts. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.